Okay, can be heard at the back. So my name is uh, Iran Segev. Uh, as Andra said, uh, I'm the president of Australian Skeptics. The, uh, those of you who follow international skeptical affairs will know that we have a bit of a reputation for being an effective organization. We, we get stuff done. And uh, what I would like to do today is share with you some of the organizational ways in which we do that. So first of all, about us, about Australian Skeptics, Inc. There's something coming up. I'm telling you. It's just taking, taking time. So we were established in 1980, so we're one of the oldest skeptical organizations in the world. Um, we have Australian Skeptics, Inc. is based in Sydney, New South Wales. We have many satellite groups, um, some of them in various states, in uh, Victoria, in, in Queensland, in, in, in the Northern Territory, uh, and some of them in cities within those, um, those states, such as Newcastle in, um, in New South Wales, um, just as an example. And uh, sometimes these organizations call themselves branches. It's a historical artifact of the way Australian skeptics came to be. We, there's no legal or formal affiliation between the groups, but we work together very closely, and I will refer to that later on. We've been having annual conventions very much like this since 1985. So this year, in, uh, on uh, the weekend of 18th, 19th of November in Sydney, will be our 30, 33rd one um, every year. We've had one every year, uh, and we're very proud of our conventions. Um, uh, we've had some very very big ones. We had TAM Australia in 2010. We had 630 people. Uh, I think this year will be bigger than that. So we, we have very successful conventions. And we have the second longest running skeptical magazine in the world. It was established in 1981. It's still running, uh, going strong for, uh, it's a quarterly, so we have uh, four uh, uh, issues a year. And we, uh, we've been running since 1981. I think only, if I, remember, if I know correctly, it's only, only Skeptical Inquirer has been running for longer. And we have one employee. And, um, and that is actually really important. Um, it sounds like, you know, not a lot, but it, but it, it makes all the difference in the world. Anders referred to it earlier. Uh, it, it makes a lot of difference to the way we operate. So, uh, about me. Um, I'm uh, an IT management consultant. Eventually, we'll actually say it on the slide. Um, I'm an IT management consultant. I, uh, I've been uh, with the committee, with the com we call our board the committee, um, but it's basically the board of the organization since 2003. I've been an active skeptic 2002, but I've been so active so very quickly that I joined the committee uh, uh, very, very early on. And I've uh, been the president of the organization from 2009 to 2012 took a bit of a break, took a breather, drank some water, and in 2014 um, uh, came back to the role, and I'm still uh, the president now. The, what I will tell you today is largely, with the exceptions of the things that I will point out, specific to the experiences I've had with Australian skeptics. So I don't expect that everything I will say is word for word exactly what you need to adopt in every skeptical organization. However, I believe that even those things that do not apply to uh, your organization, to various organizations, will give you some insight into the thinking behind how an organization is constructed. I also want to point out that um, I uh, bring with me a wealth of managerial knowledge from, from my, my work, my, my business. Uh, however, there are differences between uh, volunteer-based organizations and uh, business organizations and I've learned a lot from uh, being uh, at the helm of a skeptical organization, a volunteer organization, um, and of course, that will reflect in this presentation today. So, <laughs> these things take time. For some reason, the first, the first line takes time. Um, so, why this talk? Why am I talking about this? Organizations very often fail. Uh, it's true of volunteer organizations, it's true of commercial organizations, or most organizations, in fact, fail. And, Failure is, can manifest itself in various ways. One of the ways organizations fail is they simply cease to exist. That's the most common way. But they can also fail to achieve their objectives or uh, in some way fail to meet the expectations of the founders. Organizations are established for a reason. And if the founders or the people with, active within the organization 
do not achieve their goals, then of course that, that can be considered a failure. And, um, and volunteer-based organizations are in, a, in more of a bind than other types of organizations because with commercial organizations, there's always money. And money, it doesn't mean that there's money in the sense, you know, organizations something can be running a loss, but there's money as an objective, there's money as a way to motivate people, there's money as a way to force people to do things. So it's easy. With, vo with volunteer-based organizations, there's a lot more thought needs to be put in into how the organization operates in order to ensure, ensure that it uh, uh, continues to operate as it, um, uh, as it does. And the, plan, the, the, the solution to that is to plan. To plan ahead, be aware of where the weaknesses are, be aware of what you're trying to achieve, and make sure that you follow a plan. Um, so what I'll be, do to, be doing today is give you a bit of an inside look. Now, in some sense, um, this is a talk for organizers. However, I think it will benefit all of you in terms of understanding a little bit of the constraints on skeptical organizations and, and the, the benefits that skeptical organizations can bring to the skeptical community. And maybe it will drive some of you to become skeptical organizers, and that's also very important because there's never enough skeptical organizers. So the first thing, Susan promised an interpretive dance for some of my slides if they don't come up. So the first thing with an organiza any organization, you need to know what you're there for. You don't establish an organization simply for, to have a name on a, on a piece of paper. You want the organization to represent something, to do something, and it might sound like it's quite obvious, you know, okay, we established a skeptical organization. What do we want to do? We want to be skeptical. Well, you can do that without an organization. So you need to know what the organization is there for. You need to know what the reason is that you're putting in the time, the effort, very often the money as well. And the easiest way to answer that question is of what, what are we here for is by is to breaking it up into vision, mission, and aims. Vision is the end result. It may never be achieved. It may not even be completely achievable. It's an aspiration. It's where you want to see society, your organization, the community, whatever it is that you want to do in the future. Mission is the focus areas on the way to that vision. And aims are the activities that you will perform on the way to, while, while acting, out the, uh, uh, acting on, the, on the mission and on the way to the vision. We have adopted, on Australian, in Australian Skeptics, we've adopted, I'll, I'll actually let it start working. Oh, straight away, great. So um, we, um, we've adopted a new vision, mission, and aims just fairly recently. It took us a long time to, to fine tune our uh, statement our mission statement or vision statement, I would say probably about six months. Uh, we started with a weekend where we spent time um, um, just debating it for, for a whole weekend, two, two, two days. Then it took many months of actually w thinking about the wording. Now, the wording that you have here, society that makes decisions based on evidence, reason, and critical thinking, that actually I think it's clear to all of you that this may never be achieved. Um, or at least not completely achieved. However, working towards that goal is, is important. Uh, the pr our previous aims were a lot more internal looking and a, a lot more focused on the paranormal. Um, you can see all of those on our website, by the way, and I will point to that afterwards because I don't want you to go looking now. Um, so that's, that's our vision. This is our mission. Um, really quickly, as Australian Skeptics Inc. will advocate uh, critical thinking and scientific reasoning, actually, I'll let you read that. The, the thing is that you will see that it actually breaks up our role in society and in the skeptical movement into smaller uh, areas, into more specific things that we actually need to be active in, more, more specific areas that we need to be active in in order to achieve our vision. And finally, our aims. Um, and I want to point out that our first aim is, is essentially a new one. It's from the, from the new, um, new uh, aims, and that is to public advocate for evidence-based and rational decision-making and policy development by individuals as well as government, statutory bodies, and other organizations. Fits very well, I think, with the previous speaker. Uh, and I think it 
pretty much fits very well with the way the skeptical movement is heading today. The, uh, we spent probably about three of the six months we debated our new visions on, on, on the aims and making sure that, you know, it was eight at some point, then it was four, and then we, you know, like separated things and thought about the wording of each one, and even the order was cause for debate. Maybe it took us a little bit longer than it should, but I think it's better to get it right because you really should be bound by these. These are the things that will say, that this is what we're here for. This is, when you, when you do something in the organization, there's debate whether should we be doing this, should we not be doing this, should we spend time and effort and money on this? The, this will be your guide, so it's very important. I don't think having goals is optional. Breaking it up into vision, mission, and aims, eh, optional but advisable. All the rest, is really from the experience of Australian skeptics, and um, some of it is my opinion, um, and um, take, take out of it what you will. So, I'll tell you a little bit about the specifics of how we put it all together. And by the way, I forgot to start the timer, so you will need to indicate to me when I'm running out of time. Um, so first of all, leadership. Um, every organization needs leadership. I will not say a leader because sometimes two people can co-lead. I don't believe, from my experience, that more than two people can lead effectively. Um, leadership by committee is not really leadership. You need somebody who will actually help run the organization, set a direction, and make sure the direction perform the, the uh, organization performs as it should. And I want to make it quite clear that the leader, in, especially in a volunteer organization, but in general, the, is not there to tell people what to do. The role of a leader, and I, that's why I'm not saying a manager, okay, I'm saying a leader. The role of the leader is to make sure that the organization moves forward, and it moves forward towards its goals. A good leader, in, especially in a skeptical organization, will be somebody who's very collaborative, who's willing to listen to others, who is good at motivating people and um, is, not, is not particularly interested in, in, their, own, um, in their own position and, um, um, and their, their own name. Somebody who is interested in, in promotion and, and being out there it can be a valid member, a valued member of an, of, of an organization, but, not, but probably not the leader because the leader needs to focus on the organization. The next thing is the board or executive uh, committee. I will call it interchangeably board and committee. You need to, th there's a lot of things about a, about a board. So, uh, first of all, a board is not a social club, okay? People who want to be on the board, because that's what you do on the second Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m., shouldn't be there. So, you need to think about that in the construction of the board. The you need to be able to, you need to be, first of all, demand of people that they be active. You want to be on the, on the board, you need to be active. But you also need to ensure that people have a way out. So, for example, with Australian Skeptics, what we did was, this is, this is fairly new. This is actually one of the reasons I became president was because I realized that I needed to be that in order to enact certain changes. And one of the major changes was to uh, start with the three-year tenures on the committee. Now, it's not like after three years you have to leave, but after three years you have to think. You have to say, do I still want to be here, or is it a habit? You have to justify to yourself and to the committee why you're still there. You have to apply for re for re-election to the committee. And what surprisingly, within three years, we were left with no inactive members because they had to think about it. It's that they didn't, we didn't have to throw anybody out. People who didn't want to be active just left. Um, how the members of the board are chosen is obviously a very important aspect of, of uh, the committee, whether they're elected by the membership or by invitation. It's, it, there's problems to both. Uh, with Australian Skeptics, we chose to be a, an invitation-only committee. It has its challenges. It also has some really good things about it. For example, we can choose really good and effective committee members, and we are not prone to a hostile takeover 
which is something that has happened to, for example, the New South Wales humanists were taken over no, no, no more or less than by neo-Nazis, uh, who were not after the humanists, they were after the humanists' um, uh, property. The humanists have a house, and they just want to take over the property. Uh, they managed to eventually, through legal means, push them out, but by invitation only, that, that can't happen. We still protect our money in other ways. Another thing is, you want to have a committee that is representative, not of your current audience, but of your target audience. And that is really important. If you're going to have a committee of um, very well-qualified, very smart, 50-year-old men, and I, I have nothing against 50-year-old men, I'm 53, so, um, but, if you're going to have that, you're not going to have, you're not going to be attracting young women, for example. You're not really going to be attract anybody who's young, actually. It doesn't mean that you won't have anybody um, who's young or any women, but I, I'm saying that, by the way, you know, most skeptical organizations are majority men, majority white men, majority white men in their 50s. So, uh, <laughs> so it's something, that the, the way against it is to, to make sure that you include in your committee, in your board, Young people, women, uh, uh, we, we have now, actually in, in August, we have finally reached a goal I've been working on for years, which is more than half of our committee is women. Uh, so, um, the reason is, by the way, not because um, uh, there's something unappealing per se about a committee of men. The reality is that I don't know what's appealing to a 25-year-old woman, not intuitively anyway, not without asking. Having 25-year-old women on the committee allows me to have that perspective, allows the committee to actually work towards having more 25-year-old women on, in, the, in our um, uh, active member group. The duties of volunteers, it's a touchy point because volunteers don't get paid. Um, but that's exactly what being a volunteer means. It means you don't get paid. It does not mean that you do not have commitments. And that is something that anybody who ever volunteers to anything, and that's obviously specific to, to the committee members, but it's also true of the community at large when they volunteer for any events or any, anything that you do. They need to remember that if they say they will do something, that is a commitment. It is, not vo it is voluntary in the sense of they, they volunteer to commit. They don't volunteer to, once they commit, they, it's not voluntary to do what they committed to do and they need to be reminded of that, they need to be tracked, and it's absolutely okay for anybody, even if they're paid, to sometimes say, look, life got in the way, I, I'm unable to do what I committed to do, it happens. However, first of all, it can't happen on a regular basis, and secondly, it needs to happen in a responsible way, early enough in advance so that the organization can recover from the situation and find a solution. One of the ways to motivate an organization, and again, this is something that reflects both internally on the committee and, and externally, is to have constant targets, things to work on. Targets could be projects of various kinds. They could be events, or they could be like big projects such as, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, we, a few years ago we had a Dr. Ken Harvey, a, a skeptical activist, sued for libel. And uh, we organized a big campaign to make sure that uh, the community sponsored, uh, supported Ken, and he ended up not paying a cent uh, out of pocket for the, le for the legal challenge. But uh, uh, again, that was a big, a big move. It uh, created a lot, of, um, um, a lot of noise within the, com within the com committee and within the community at large, and that was a great target. However, you also need targets on an ongoing basis. Within the committee, one of the things we've done was we started thinking about what are the main things the committee does on a regular basis. So we have magazine and public relations. We have uh, finance to manage. We have um, grants. We, we, we are an organization with money. I'll talk about that shortly. We give grants. Somebody needs to assess those grants. We have events. We have, okay, you know, every few years we organize a convention. There's all kinds of things that we do on a regular basis, or we have an investigation subcommittee. So all of these, all of these areas of focus we established a subcommittee within our bigger committee to be focused on. And these are people who are dedicated to these areas. So there's, they, they constantly have targets around these uh, focus areas, narrow focus areas, and there's something for them to do and something for them to look at. It's very important to have that. It's very important to have that for the wider community as well. 
one of the main roles, in my opinion, of a skeptical organization is to be a hub for media. And there's, there's a few things about being a hub for media. So you need to be known to the public. Um, and being a hub for media is part of being known to the public. But you also need to be known to journalists. So there's no easy way around that. But the, 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 the easiest way of being known to journalists is to be there for them. Journalists nowadays are underpaid and, over, and way too busy. They, their deadlines are impossible. Um, there's no time for proper investigative journalists. If you help them by doing some of the work for them, you, you'll be doing very well. So some of the things that you need to focus on is that there needs to be there so, somebody there to answer the phone. Okay. There needs to be somebody there to answer the phone. It doesn't actually mean necessarily to answer. First of all, there needs to be a phone number. But if you don't answer the phone straight away, that's fine. But call back within an hour, because the journalist in an hour has something else to do. So you have to get back to them. If they send an email, you have to get back to them straight away. When you get back to them within an hour, you have to have something to say to them. So one of the best ways to help journalists nowadays is to have lists of experts at your disposal, people who are, first of all, quotable. That's, that's the most basic thing. But if there are people who can actually be interviewed, people who are good in front of the camera or behind the mic, and can at short notice be available for interviews, preferably obviously more than one person in, in the areas of focus of your organization, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, because the journalists who get that kind of help from you will appreciate it and will come back for more. You'll be able to send your message. So, so that is obviously um, very important um, to do. You need to also have online presence. Without online presence, you simply do not exist. If you do not have a website, um, a, feed, uh, a Facebook page and um, Twitter feed, you, you, you will not be noticeable. And they need to be active. Your website needs to be updated on a regular basis. Your Facebook uh, feed needs to constantly be moving. Twitter, all the, you know, all the time. It doesn't even need to do, be things about your organization. Just link to something. But be, make sure people follow you all the time. Otherwise, you're not visible. Awards are another way of attracting attention. We give awards annually. There's positive awards, which attract a modicum of attention. I, I, unfortunately, look, we'll continue to give the, the, the positive awards. We have a Skeptic of the Year. We have uh, uh, an, uh, a award, an award called the Thornet Award for the Promotion of Reason, which, we, which comes with a check. And it's, it's given to a member of the public who does, so not a member of the skeptical community who's done something to promote skepticism. Uh, but we also have a negative award, which unfortunately attracts more attention. It's called the Ben Spoon Award after Uri Geller and his um, spoons. Um, is Randy here? Randy once uh, said about Uri Geller that if he bends spoons with the power of his mind, he's doing it the hard way. Um, so, um, so we bent one with our hands and put it on a, on a plinth, and, um, and we give that once a year. Nobody's ever claimed it, by the way. Uh, the, the, thing about the, the, the thing about those negative awards is they're, they're very funny. They're definitely funny for us internally, but it's very easy for them to become mean in the eyes of the public. So you need to be very careful not to be mean. Uh, if somebody needs to be attacked, like anti-vaxxers, you don't want to go soft on them but make sure that it's not personally mean, that you attack their message, not them individually. And also, try to pun punch up and not down. Punch down, you are almost always be perceived as mean. So, you know, like a couple of years ago, we gave the award to a famous chef in Australia. He's on um, one of the food shows, which I try to ignore. Um, his name is Pete Evans, and he promotes all kinds of woo, from the paleo diet to the risks of using um, uh, sunscreen in the country with the highest um, uh, rates of skin cancer in the world. So we gave it to him. He's already controversial. He's already in the public eye. We were definitely not seen as being uh, controversial or punching down or being mean by attacking him for what he was doing. But just be careful with the awards. Um, members, you want a broad following, obviously. Uh, I've discussed already about how the structure of the board ref uh, uh, is uh, important for your membership. Again, the role and the, how members are included, how they feel that they are members of the organization is something that 
I'm not going to give you answers for, but it's something that you need to consider. For example, with Australian skeptics, for a very long time, members were simply people who were subscribers to our magazine. Um, they were not able to vote for the committee. I already mentioned that our committee is by invitation only. Uh, but obviously, we constantly, from within our member pool, in invited people for the committee. The, um, what's happened over the years is that we found that as uh, magazine subscriptions fall, uh, the active activity in our events, for example, uh, rises. So that told us that there's something wrong there. So we're now working on a slightly different model. We found, we, we discussed it with our membership, and basically there were a lot of mostly younger people who said, we don't want the magazine. So we said, okay, so just subscribe and you'll get the magazine and don't read it. No, no, I don't want the magazine. So they just don't read magazines to them the fact that it's a subscription is a negative. So they, are, they were happy to spend the same amount of money on simply supporting the organization. So we're working on a supporters model at the moment, which will come out soon. Again, I, I don't have answers to these questions, but you definitely want to think about how you make people included, how you make them feel like they're part of the organization. The organization needs to be uh, protected. In particular, the members of the organization need to be protected. If you're, you're skeptics, you're going to say controversial things. You're going to say things that upset uh, people. And there's a chance that you'll get sued. In Australia, there's a way to protect yourself by becoming an incorporated association. You protect the members of the organization. The organization can still get sued. However, the individuals within the organization, if I say something as president of Australian skeptics that upsets someone, then you know, they can sue the organization. They can't sue me personally. OK, Uri Geller. You know. um, so the, in all countries, there will be something in the European Union. Definitely, there will be some structures that allow you to protect the members of the organization. It's very important. Still, at the same time, don't, you know, as members, it, you, are, you can be sued personally for something that you said. Just make sure that you're responsible in what you say. Um, funding is obviously very important. You want to have, uh, have funding because without funding, it's very difficult to be effective. You can't have a website without funding. There's only so much money that volunteers will be willing to spend on travel and printing and websites and all kinds of things like that. The best way um, to raise funds is through donations, especially in the early days. Uh, we have been very fortunate uh, with bequests. Bequests, uh, to those of you for whom English is not the first language, is basically money that people leave in their will. Um, people, live a lot, uh, people leave a lot more money in their will than they give in donations because they don't need that money anymore. So, um, and, and really, we have been uh, very fortunate. There, there's a cultural element to how you do it, and you need to be sensitive about it, okay? Otherwise, you know, it could very easily be creepy. But, but there are, you know, just think about how within your own organization, within your own culture, you can come up with a uh, way to encourage people to, uh, to give to the organization, specifically in bequests. I'll skip events because um, I, I need uh, a bit more time to speak about two minutes. And I want to speak about collaboration, which, OK. So collaboration. That's probably a good note to end on. And it's been mentioned um, um, by Sophie. It's been mentioned by Andres. Um, the, we have the strength of a common language within Australia that allows us to, to have all these organizations collaborate towards a common goal quite easily. However, I think it's very important within Europe to not be, dis, not be discouraged by the, by the cultural and language barriers. Don't let them stand in your way. First of all, my impression, and I could be wrong, but my impression is that definitely the younger uh, members of society generally speak English. So count on that to some extent at least, to use material, use, use the common language in order to ensure that you're able to collaborate. It's really, the, the reason collaboration is so important is because it's just better use of resources. That's, that's the main thing. If you, don't, if you don't collaborate, you will be repeating things, you're repeating mistakes, and you'll be repeating the actions that other organizations have already been through. And it's just unnecessary. I think, um, um, the EXO is probably a, in a good position to help in that. Uh, I think it's very important to communicate on a regular basis. Make sure, I don't know, maybe something like a, a, a mailing list where the heads of the local organizations report once a month on what their activities are. 
would be a good idea because that, that's the kind of thing where you can say, oh, I'm actually working on something similar at the moment. Let's talk. You know, okay, so you can't actually collaborate on something specific because the laws are different, because the, the focus areas may be local. However, techniques, um, um, resources, material, you know, if they're, um, if they're translated between the languages, there's all kinds of things that you can do much better if you collaborate than you can do as individual organizations. And I, that, that's probably the strongest message I can give you collaborate between all the various European organizations. And um, if I haven't answered some of your questions about how organizations can be more effective, I'd be happy to answer more questions in the panel later because we've run out of time. And you can also write to me. Um, my email is quite easy to remember if you remember my name, which is difficult in its own right. Um, write to me and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much.